Class is back in session, and with it, miraculous kills, heart-wrenching deaths, betrayals, and a school filled with shocking truths and dubious mysteries to uncover. Will our 16 ultimate high school students be the shining pillars of hope the world needs them to be, or will they submit to their selfish desires and fall to despair? To avoid spoiling the game for those of you still on the fence, I've broken up this review into two parts. Part 1 will cover the overarching concepts, gameplay mechanics, story setup, and my opinions therein while very carefully not spoiling anything past chapter 1. Part 2, however, will spoil just about everything else non-discriminately. Each section will be clearly marked, so watch out for that, and thanks for watching. Danganronpa V3 Killing Harmony is exactly what you expect it to be. Just like in previous installments, you and a colorful cast of characters have been plunged into a sickening situation where it's kill or be killed. And when someone is eventually murdered, everyone goes to a class trial where your careful investigations and spirited debating will decide the fate of all your friends' lives. Seemingly, the only way to stop the game is to win or to die. But is that really the case? Alongside finding the blackened and protecting the innocent, it will be up to you to find the truth behind it all. However, before any of that, it's time to meet our new hosts. Now joining the cast are the five cute, yet endlessly annoying, Monocubs. Ranging from a 70s rock star to a ninja wannabe, the Monocubs are an attempt to add some zest into an otherwise quickly stagnating formula, but failed spectacularly. By far, one of my least favorite aspects of V3 lies squarely on these little punks that add absolutely nothing to the game except to be a flimsy slash convenient plot device and to provide strictly unentertaining commentary. At times, I can kind of see where they might have been interesting, but for the most part it seems like they're just a poor excuse for comic relief. Conversely, one of my favorite new additions is something quite small, almost unnoticed, maybe a bit underutilized. In fact, gameplay-wise, nothing changed, but with this little mechanic, you'll need to fundamentally rethink how you approach class trials. It's time to lie. You can commit perjury on the stand in the hopes that it'll move the trial along to a more important point without getting hung up on the small things that don't necessarily have solid evidence. Such a thing could have been a monumental disaster. However, the times you're required to lie are pretty abundantly obvious, while still making you feel like a silver-tongued scumbag for performing that necessary evil. What's also great is that nearly every time you lie, there are people there ready to call you out on it, making it feel so much worse. After all, you're here to find the truth. You don't want to deceive your friends. But sometimes, it's necessary. Also within the class trials, there's a few new debate methods like a non-stop panic mode where you'll have three characters all trying to shout over each other, forcing you to silence them and find the correct statement to contradict. There's also a debate scrum which pits two halves of the remaining participants against each other to debate and refute arguments one by one. Similarly nice, the graphics and visual design has seen a favorable facelift. For example, at certain parts in the trial, a character's podium may be pushed to the center, putting all focus on them alone. Additionally, the overall UI has been updated to look cooler, sleeker, and present more information. 3D exploration-wise, the environment you're placed in is a fantastic mix of both Danganronpa 1 and 2. V3 expertly blends the more drab school setting with each ultimate student's personal touch and even includes a grassy, sunlit outside area to give some much-needed fresh air in an otherwise claustrophobic building. While most of the game is Danganronpa through and through, I thoroughly enjoyed these new little additions that help keep the experience fresh and actively engaging. Alright, but that's not being positive. Let's get down to some issues. Immediately noticeable, the PC port is awful. The buttons not being tailored for PC play and some general archaicness aside, the way they handled button input and display in-game is outright unacceptable. Not only do the on-screen UI elements not reflect keyboard keys, but they fail to differentiate when those keys change on you. In other words, for most of the first chapter, I was under the impression the Z key was effectively the A button on the controller, the X key was the B button, and so on. However, upon getting to a scrum debate, all of a sudden the SK became the A button, the D key became the B button, and so on. So here I was playing this highly anticipated $60 game within hours of release and I'm dead stuck on a quick time event sequence because evidently my button inputs weren't working. 
Several failures later, completely demolishing the pace and excitement of the trial at hand, I finally discovered the correct control scheme by complete chance after some trial and error. But it doesn't end there. The whole system in place simply sucks when it comes to more demanding reactions. The final argument in particular requires a metric ton of on-beat button presses, which is remarkably difficult to get used to. Granted, on normal difficulty it isn't a huge issue, but it can still be incredibly disappointing that even after several PC ported games from the series, they still can't even handle this relatively simple feature. And one other major complaint. Why the mini games and class trials? It makes no sense to me to have these side activities that one, aren't murder mystery themed, one is a bland driving sequence. Two, slow the pace of the game down considerably. Class trials should be fast and exciting, why go out of your way to slow it down? Three, aren't designed in such a way that feels like you're authentically discovering a buried answer through logic alone. Most of the time it felt like you were either 100% knew the answer, or it was trial and error. And four, they aren't even designed well within themselves. Every single one of them felt like a kid's first created video game in Game Maker Studio or something. In all three Danganronpa games, I never once looked forward to or enjoyed my time with the minigames. I haven't the slightest idea why the devs of the series insist so stubbornly to include them. In the effort to avoid unnecessary spoilers, I will avoid commenting too much on the writing, but what you see is effectively what you get. Each of the characters are uniquely identifiable and have their own motivations, backstories, way of speaking, expected actions, and are as such fun to be around. Even though I feel the members of the group are a lot less cohesive than previous titles, I still went out of my way to interact with each and every one of them and enjoyed seeing what they would do or say at each particular instance. Overarching story-wise, it's a pretty straightforward murder mystery told chapter by chapter, with a bit of an extended narrative showing itself every now and then, with a rather climactic finish where many of the mysteries are tied up. Whether or not that formulaic approach is a negative is entirely up to you. I personally still found the game as a whole enjoyable, but I will be wary of a future title following too closely to the established framework. Fans of the series will probably already know for certain whether or not they're interested in picking this title up even without my saying, and those still on the fence might instead want to try the reduced in cost Danganronpa 1 or 2. While as a fan I think V3 is mostly excellent, it doesn't introduce anything groundbreakingly new, and I approximately evaluate the character, plot, and setting to be roughly on par with the previous installments. In essence, Danganronpa V3 Killing Harmony is unapologetically more Danganronpa with a slightly fresher coat of paint. And with that, part one is over. Hopefully not too much was spoiled, ruining an otherwise fantastic experience. Anyhow, we're now getting into the full reveal of spoilers, starting with the prologue and going forward chapter by chapter. So if you do plan on playing V3, please stop watching now. All right, so the game begins and it's not off to a great start with this pseudo horror game feel. I like how in past games you started off on a positive note and then proceeded to descend into the madness on a steady pace. Here, however, we're thrown into the darkness and confusion from the get-go. The issue is, there's no normal to run counter to how foul the mood is. In other words, it's much more difficult to appreciate just how sickening the killing game is and how the characters are feeling therein if despair is all we know as a player. Granted, coming from D1 and D2, I have that baseline by default, but newcomers to the series certainly won't and will be worse off because of it. Regardless, we're immediately treated to a rather unusual, but otherwise nice looking presentation. Like I mentioned previously, I love the seamless blending of the normal school, wacky ultimate labs, and the outside world. Similarly pleasant, the visual novel section saw a nice upgrade by having multiple characters' portraits on the screen at once, making conversations flow that much more smoothly. Following suit, the character design is unique, inviting, and full of vibrant personality without being too wacky and over the top. This is especially interesting when compared to their normal school uniforms shown at the very beginning. To wrap up the prologue, the pace is kind of out of whack for he has to go through the intro motions twice over and then straight into everyone's formulaic introduction. I would have preferred bucking this trend in favor of a more seamless way of getting to know everyone, but it's not that bad of a way to kickstart this particular kind of setting. Also, I think it's rad that we started with the female protagonist, as well as the fact that she has an actual ultimate skill. 
More or less, we start this chapter with an odd platforming section that is supposed to funnel all of our hope into this impossible escape situation and plunge us into despair. I mean, I guess that works? My impression of it was is that it seemed like another shoehorn minigame with a weak plot connotation. However, evidently, we not only come back to beat this level later on, but you could actually beat it on your first try if you're good enough. The reward of which, funnily enough, ends the game. Soon after, we're introduced to a marvelous first blood motive. The first to murder gets the greatest reward they could possibly ask for. Complete immunity. What a great incentive. Literally all you would have to do is walk up to someone in broad daylight, anyone, anyone at all, and stab them in the gut and then go scot-free. Ah, so beautiful. But then a disaster happens. No one takes the perk, and because of it, another, significantly less interesting motive is introduced. A time limit. I despise the two-day time limit motive. It completely goes against the entire idea Danganronpa is built on. The students should kill because they want to, because they succumbed to their selfish desires, not because they absolutely had to. After some time investigating, we get down to the last few seconds before everyone was supposed to die. Then, the first murder of the game happens right under our nose. Keiri, our protagonist at the time and under the guise of wanting to kill the mastermind, sacrificed herself to try and end the killing game based on the detective's intuition. Unfortunately for her, and everyone else, that intuition was not correct. Above all else, I wholeheartedly applaud the risky decision to not only take out a great character early, but to kill off the character that happens to be our protagonist for the initial chapter. What's greater still is that you totally could have seen it coming based on the way she was acting and the information available right after the investigation phase. It certainly took me by surprise, but not in a bad way. It all came together exceptionally well, even despite the slightly underhanded, unreliable point of view tactic. But there is a major problem here, at least in my opinion. I absolutely loathe the fact that we lose the opportunity for not only a female protagonist, which is distinctly unusual and interesting, but we end up being stuck with a typical anime looking lead carrying the detective tag. Ugh. There's so much lost potential here. What's even worse than a detective existing in this game in the first place, but since he's our actual protagonist, he's never going to commit or even threaten what could be an unsolvable murder. During the trial section to discover and put K80 to death, we're taking on a ride introducing some cool new gameplay mechanics, terrible minigames, and an update to the visual presentation. I already covered this in part 1 so I won't parrot it too much, but the trial sections are a one of a kind near masterpieces. If only those terrible minigames didn't exist to spoil an otherwise brilliant experience. Going into chapter 2, our new hero, the detective, sheds that cool looking hat and has gained some more confidence in the wake of his pseudo girlfriend's death. That's neat, I guess? Then after opening the gambling building, we're met with a flashback device. It's a peculiar item that unlocks memories. Throughout the entire game, gaining memories of the outside world will be a constant motive and overarching plot device. By extension, we also get a monopad showcasing what each of us are missing back home. The idea being someone will kill just to leave. Unfortunately for Monokuma, the pads got all mixed up because of the monocubs and only a few people actually got to see their own motive. Regardless, the killing continues unabated. Maid Sama ended up pulling off some crazy moves to transport the given up on life tennis dude into Maid Girl's magic trick. Honestly, I wasn't a big fan of this case since the way she pulled it off was pretty immediately obvious, but we still spent a large amount of trial time and eventually whittling down the small pieces of information to eventually discover the most likely culprit. A new chapter begins, and a new floor revealed, and wow is it spooky. By extension we get an equally chilling motive, the ability to resurrect one of our dead friends. Monokuma doesn't lie about these kind of things, so that must mean it's possible, right? Over the few days of general exploration and free time, the worst possible thing happens. But no, not, not someone being murdered in cold blood. Think worse. The secular versus non-secular group division. Oh, fun. Thankfully, it doesn't stick around for too long for the obvious reason, but I seriously despise the invasion of the religion angle and the thinly veiled criticism accompanying it. 
But that's all I'll say about that. Anyway, the murder gets underway and it seems to be a locked room environment. A bit tricky. In the course of investigating, the anthropologist recommends a seance to possibly call on Angie and have her point out the killer. However, before that can happen, Kung Fu Chick is killed under the dog cage during the seance. A seemingly impossible double murder. Just how did it go down? This is easily my favorite chapter in the entire Danganronpa series, primarily because there were so many different theories swirling in my head around the time. Starting with the resurrection incentive. If Monokuma says it's possible, it has to be a thing, right? But how do you resurrect someone without actually bringing them back to life? Similarly, is communicating with the dead a real thing in this universe? Was the initial murderer scared that they would actually get Angie to speak beyond the grave and try to stop the seance even if they had to kill to do so? Why is Kaito acting so suspiciously? What did Kokichi discover right before the class trial? Did Mage Girl do it since she recommended the room and possibly hold a grudge against Kung Fu Chick because she felt betrayed? And are there two culprits, or just one? I was thinking across so many different lines of thoughts, and it was endlessly enjoyable even despite the fact that many of them were disproven over the course of the trial. The thing is, we had plenty of information available and many of them could have been right if things were just slightly different. So it ended up going down like this. The anthropologist set up the rooms to be ready for his eventual murder. Careful planning not only shifted suspicion away from him, but redirected it to whomever would suggest a room. What's kind of funny is that Angie originally wasn't supposed to be killed. She just happened to enter the room Kyo was in while he was setting up the boards. But why kill more? Why not just stop at the lock room murder of Angie? Without a doubt, more crimes leave more evidence, and had he not went through the second murder, he might have had a better chance. But those kind of motivations don't apply to an incestuous lunatic. Within the scope that most murders in the series are for self-preservation, for someone in particular, or a righteous cause, I thoroughly enjoy that there's just this one guy who is just batshit insane and wanted to murder because he could. I mean, he says he was close to 100 girls murdered. That's quite a bit. You probably deserve to die. Ah, and at the last few moments, Robokid killed himself for no reason. I guess there isn't a monocub uprising happening behind the scenes. Okay then, why did the first two die just randomly? I just, it kind of like circles back to why the monocubs suck so much. They just, they're pointless in every single way. Unexpectedly, but not unwelcome, is the journey into a virtual world for the fourth chapter setting. I'm a big fan of these kind of situations because it takes the killing game formula and gives it a new set of mentally shifting rules to adhere to. Broad stroke series of events, Inventor Chick went to great lengths to try and kill Kokichi, but ended up getting killed herself by Gonta. Why? Because apparently, the outside world is such shit, Gonta thought he should mercy kill everyone. While I thoroughly enjoyed the investigations into the mysteries of this case, I disliked who ended up doing it and why. True, he discovered the flashback light. Was that really enough to drastically overhaul his already established pacifist personality? It just didn't sit right with me. Still, I gotta give credit to the devs for making this one of the saddest scenes in the series. Going to have betrayed himself, murdered his friend, forgot about it, but still accepted his fate regardless because that's where the facts pointed to. He didn't look away from the judgment handed down to him by the very people he wanted to mercy murder only a short while ago. R.I.P. Gonta. Based on some light looking into other people's opinion, Chapter 5 seems to be most people's favorite. I, on the other hand, thought it was one of the weakest in the entire series. But there's a lot to cover, so let's take it one step at a time. First off, we discover that we're on a spaceship, and also, Rontaro was the ultimate gladiator, or something. Later on, we make it past that platforming section with the Electro Hammers and find out just like in past games, the outside world is effectively in ruins and there's no home for us out there at all. We were all killing for nothing. Worse still, Kokichi claims to be the dastardly mastermind. As a bit of a ranty side note, I am so sick of Kaito's character. He's the most useless, egotistical scumbag of them all and has done nothing but soak up suspicion and constantly throw up death flags with no payoff. He constantly tries to come off as the hero of the story even though the piece of shit literally has done nothing all game. In fact, his delusionally inflated nature seriously had me consider him the mastermind for a while. Imagine that, a dumbass like him being the one behind it all. Yuck. 
I kind of get that he was like somewhat of a tragic character that doesn't alleviate the fact that he pissed me off all game long. Rant over. Anyhow, the chapter defining murder happens in a very boring way that entirely hinges on the very intentional lack of information given to the player and more importantly, Monokuma. While the idea is neat, this is not well done or interesting writing. Almost the entire trial was the monotonous squeezing out of minor bits of information over a long period of time. Even worse still, the Kaito Kokichi double play did nothing except slow down the already slow pace of this trial to a belly chafing crawl. It seems like a novel concept considering the idea was to try and stop the game due to Monokuma not being able to give an omniopotent verdict, but does that really mean the rest of the case has to be so damn boring? Earlier, I mentioned how much I loved that Chapter 3 gave us so many avenues for theories, and yet Chapter 5 did absolutely none of that. True, you could have a theory or two, but it would be entirely impossible to give a substantiated guess because there simply wasn't enough information to warrant solid speculation. In the end, Kaito and Kokichi worked together to try and create a trap for the mastermind, but before the verdict could be handed out, Space Kid revealed himself and let Kokichi die in vain. The idea is cool, don't get me wrong. If this were a book, manga, or anime, I think I would have enjoyed that concept much more, but the execution and gameplay and in pacing was exceptionally poor. As an aside, one really cool moment in the chapter is when Kokichi reveals that he actually hates the killing game despite his general provokefulness or his otherwise happy-go-lucky attitude. It just goes further to prove how great of a character he is. At long last, the final chapter where everything comes together and at the same time, not at all. For the first half portion, Kibo goes haywire and starts shooting the place up while we continue to investigate the rest of the school. We start by finding the other characters' ultimate labs, which gives us clues like Rentower being the ultimate survivor from a killing game gone by, a book in Kokichi's lab detailing truths we weren't aware of, the secret room behind the library containing a few items, a secret passage, the Monokuma birthing device, and finally, the room where the memory creating flashback devices were created. Old mysteries are tied up, new ones are discovered, and one final trial to piece it all together. As it were, KED didn't actually kill Rontaro. Her shot put missed completely and it fell harmlessly on the ground beside him. However, to keep the game going, Shirogane, the mastermind, used the secret passage in the girls' restroom to kill Rontaro, take his survivor perk monopad, and escape through the hidden room. This is Danganronpa at its best. Everything about the first half of Chapter 6 is an unforgettable display of immaculate storytelling. And hell, to give credit where credit is due, this is the only point in time where the Monocubs were actually interesting and impactful in a genuine way. By having each of them represent testimony, you can have a more dynamic non-stop debate in a situation where the remaining characters are both limited and lacking in energy. Well then, oh boy, that was a great game. Probably my favorite. Uh, wait, what? Apparently, it's not over. Oh jeez, I don't like where this is going. So, Chunko is is back? But, that, that, but that's not a good thing, because at that exact moment, my love for this game starts to crumble. Over the course of like an hour or so, we have to sit there and listen to this phony talk about how nothing is real, everything is a game, our memories are fate, and we're just the 53rd season of the killing game in an otherwise peaceful world. Hey, did you know everything you did in that 20-ish hour lead up? Doesn't matter, all fake, nothing matters. There's a bit of a salvaging attempt in a few ways though. Like how accepting hope was accepting future despair, but rejecting both would be the only way to eliminate despair, and the idea that while all their memories may be fake, their experiences were very real. Also cute, the Claire Deloon piano cues were really good. Not only is it a callback to the first case, but to the tragedy of KED at the hands of Team Dong and Rampa. But then I forget about all those cool things because the ending keeps limping along in a painfully pathetic way. The devs gave themselves an out by having the quote unquote in game audience sort of represent the real life audience by saying things like, I've been a fan forever, you can't treat me like this, or the charming, you can't end it like that, we deserve a proper ending. More than anything, it felt insulting that as a consumer, I'm being told I'm an asshole because I want a satisfying conclusion to this video game that I bought. What makes this even worse is that they totally could have done both. 
Have your lie infested ending and pseudo audience commentary, but give us something to hold on to in return. Something like Mikado Neigi running up the end saying something like, Hey, we found you. You know, something. Then we can think, huh, so the events in T1 aren't fake. Then we can go from there and speculate on what really happened, both on the events within the game, before it, and what could theoretically happen later. The way they handled it is not cool ambiguity, it's laziness, which is too bad because the rest of the game is so magnificent. I'm depressed that my otherwise fantastic experience was soured by not only a bad ending, but a directly insulting one. And there you have it, Danganronpa V3 killing Harmony in all its gory glory. I have to say that right up to the Junko slash Team Danganronpa reveal, this was probably my favorite Danganronpa game, but wow, oh wow, did they ruin it with their up their own ass ending and ridiculous content gating shenanigans post credits. Killing Harmony is strictly more Danganronpa and I can appreciate it for that alone. However, looking towards the future, I hope to see an overhaul in the formula or outright putting the Danganronpa series as we know it to rest and applying their talent for murder mystery to a new intellectual property. But until then, so long, farewell. well.